questions into the ask a questions feature down below. And um, I think it's now exactly uh, half past. So I will do a very quick introduction and say, welcome Danielle Lohenberg. Uh, it's great to have you. Um, Danielle is actually a colleague of mine at California Digital Library and, and works on the Dryad project. And we really appreciate you taking the time to come present for us. So take it away. Awesome. Thanks so much for having me. Um, this is an interesting uh, topic to bring up because in 2018 at Pitapalooza, I actually brought up this exact same topic uh, with Mark Hannell. I don't know if you're on the line right now and Gustavo from Dataverse. And we talked about how do we better link related works um, from data repositories to everything else. And I say this as um, self-critical that I think the community needs to really move and expand on this that three years later we're still at that same problem stage and we know that the power of persistent identifiers are when we use them downstream and we can expose linkages and connections not just assigning a PID and so that's kind of the premise of what I want to walk through today. So Dryad is a data publishing platform for those who aren't familiar and we love PIDs. So we use ORCID for login. We have co-author ORCIDs um, that's available for anyone to use. We were the first repository to put in ROAR IDs for our institutional affiliations. We assign data site DOIs, cross-ref funder registry, and we harness the power of PIDs to look at usage with the Make Data Count initiative. But when we looked at our related works, so the section where an author's coming in, they're submitting their data, and they can say it's related to another data set, code, articles, it was a mess. So Dryad's been around for 10 years, and when we were looking through about 100,000 rows of data to clean up, we found things like this. And I'm not sure how well you, know, you can see it on the screen, but we saw manuscript numbers that people put in. That's not a PID. That's also not something that really should have been shared um, and something that'll be published. We saw random IDs. We don't know what these numbers correspond to. And then we saw people putting in a, a proper DOI format for an article, but look how many different types of relationships types that they were using. And some may say that's not a problem. However, some of these are not actually then brought into data site as a citation. So there was just really no rhyme or reason, but also not a lot of guidance. And we felt like even we, we were having trouble getting researchers to understand what to use. Even our curators were thinking, well, what's, what's the best one that we should clean up? Should we write back to authors? What is that guidance that we give? And so we decided to just take a step and make this a lot easier for our researchers. And I know that a lot of you will have comments on this and that's what our discussion will be based on. Um, but what we did was try to just remove all of those barriers and better capture so that we could actually get more related works. And so what looks here just like open boxes is actually a lot of transformations we're doing in the background. So if someone gives us a DOI in the 10 dot format, we automatically transform it to the doi.org URL. If someone gives us an accession number from EBI, NCBI, or Treebase, we put it into the proper URL format for that. Um, and then if someone gives us just free text or random, random manuscript numbers, then we give them a warning and say, is this a persistent identifier with some information around that? And then when we put that on a published work from a recent COVID data set, you can see then someone put the DOI for their preprint and they put in a URL uh, for their software. We're struggling with thinking, you know, how do we limit it to a DOI for software? We really can't because we still want to capture GitHub URLs. Um, but this is how we thought it was our best chance at making it easier to get that information and then make it easier to display these related works. And so they're all being indexed with data site um, appropriately. But this kind of raises a big question. We're going against best practices in a lot of ways. We're not giving researchers the ability to choose the related work. We've assigned that relation type in the back end, depending on what kind of work it is. And so how are we going to improve our metadata, get our researchers to understand things, but also have it be best practice? And 
typically I've leaned towards, well, let's just make it easier. But this seems to be a situation where I really think that our paid community needs to be a little more flexible and think through other ways that we can make this work. And to, you know, give some insight into a Dryad user, it's a multidisciplinary repository. Most of our users are coming to us because their journal told them to, and they've never published their data before. Our metadata is general for all disciplines, and there aren't those specifics that maybe disciplinary repositories have more experience in. So it's a very basic level that we're trying to accommodate. Um, and so I have a few questions, and I'm hoping to bring on um, some folks here who may be here. So um, John, would it be possible to bring on Ted Haberman onto the stage? Sure, I just sent um, Ted a, a ping inviting him on the screen. So, someone got directed to Dryad, nice, love that. Um, so, <laughs> you know, Ted and I had been talking for a while about this and how we could best um, accommodate this. And I think Ted has a lot of things to say about um, what we're losing by not giving researchers the ability to, to, to choose their own relationship type. And there's Ted. So Ted, can you tell us a little bit about how you've in your metadata experience or what you found in your research, um, how much that's really varied around relationship types and why maybe Dryad needs to think about having all of those relationship types instead of removing them like we just did? Yeah, I think, you know, uh, particularly in data site where a lot of your meta and in Crossref, of course, that, you know, relations put to cross in Crossref and, uh, you know, uh, Dryad has done a great job in adopting ROARs and, and moving forward on this. I think you're, I think that uh, s selecting the relation type based on basically the resource type of what they're pointing to is, uh, is sort of losing a lot of the robustness and a lot of the importance of those different kinds of connections. So I think, I don't know how, you know, you're the, I was thinking since we talked the other day about how you could visually, you know, make something that people could collect, could, could click on sort of to, to, to select those relation types or something, um, you know, the guidance and of course, uh, relation types, as you noted, is a long list of different kinds of things. Most of them are two-way, um, so that might be helpful. But the other thing that I wanted to mention is a lot of these relationships develop it over over time. You know, sites is is derivative from is variant form of, um, and so the you know being able to edit and add relations to metadata as a, over time, I think, is also something which is a uh, uh, a big question for repositories and, and researchers and, and authors of metadata. Um, really, uh, it's something that, that I, I've been working on uh, a lot of, uh, you know, thinking about how to do that, how to, you know, metadata is a long-term relationship, not a one-night stand. And, um, you know, we really need to, we need, we need to keep that in mind when we're thinking about these. Yeah, and we've been thinking a lot about how we can incentivize folks to come back and update their metadata. So in that example, they gave us their preprint. How can we ensure that they're going to come back and also give us the article? Um, and and Marco, I agree, consistency on this. You know, how do we incentivize researchers to do something that we think is easy, but we also see as important, but explain it. And that's this question I keep coming back to is, how do we even explain why this is so important to them if they're just trying to click, click through, right? And so another question that I have about this for you, Ted, before I let you go is, how do we explain URLs? So we were talking about, oh, well, if someone gives us a URL, we should say, oh, well, this is a problem. It's your lab website that's not stable. This isn't a stable PID or, and uh, GitHub a GitHub URL, and we always say, well, it's not stable, it's a URL, and yet then we're putting accession numbers and DOIs in a URL format. How do we explain in common terms, and this is a question for everyone, if you can put an answer in chat, how do we explain to a researcher a PID if we're saying URLs is not you know, persistent, and then we're putting a DOI in that format. And this is something that's come up a lot with our users. Does anyone else have answers besides Ted? Type it in. 
Um, yeah, I think, you know, there's this, it's complicated a little bit by this, this idea of HTTP identifiers. So a lot of groups in, in international standards land where I spent some time are using HTTP, uh, you know, URLs um, essentially as, um, as, as URIs. So that, that and, and a lot of that happened earlier when there were a lot of I, identifiers that weren't resolvable. So, so making them into URLs sort of was a step towards making them resolvable. Of course, we're getting better at that these days. Um, you know, I think, I think the, you know, explaining the P and persistent, like in the last talk was an interesting thing and, and helping, you know, maybe if, if you know, dealing with users, there's, you know, it's never easy to find. There is no single silver bullet, obviously. There's not even maybe a tin bullet. Um, but yeah, so I, I don't, I don't, explaining, what do you mean my website's not persistent? Well, you know. Um, interesting question. I'll, I'll be looking forward to seeing the answers. Yeah, there's some good answers coming in. And yeah, Paul uh, said HTTP URLs are URIs. I, I I understand that, Paul. Thanks for pointing it out. But yeah, the the location versus identifier thing has been going on for a long time, and it's uh, it's something that's confusing for a lot of people that haven't thought about it a lot. Yeah. So. Um, Martin brings up a point about how relationship types can be overwhelming. It's something Ted and I have talked about a lot. And I'm wondering actually um, if we can, thank you, Ted, for coming on stage. And uh, John, would it be possible to bring Christian up? Christian. <laughs> so uh, for those who aren't, Familiar Christian Garza is at Datasite, and he wrote some blog posts a lot about um, the relationship types and how those types um, correlate with something going to event data as a citation or not. Um, and so I'm hoping Christian may be able to come up here and give us a little bit more information, uh, information about how we can kind of navigate all of those relationship types that we're all facing when working with Datasite or Crossref. Um, indexing this information. I actually don't see Chris John. If he's um, in the crowd, can he just put something in chat so I can invite him up on the stage? Um. Yep, there, there he is. is. OK, <laughs> sorry about that. I just couldn't find you based on search, but I have just invited him up on the stage. Sorry for the delay. I should have also said Ted is that metadata game changers and Ted is a metadata specialist. So uh, should have given some background there. That's why we're specifically talking. Ted just put out a blog post about some of this as well today. Anyways, Christian. So can you tell us a little bit more about tips for how we can navigate the relationship types or um, any other information we should know about trying to when we're using those? Yeah, but particularly, well, I mean, particularly in the context of and data citations or citations uh, between DOIs. Um, I think like a year back in RDA, we were trying to figure out what would be the best relation types, or I mean the most appropriate relation types between that can use to capture citations. And we came out with a subset of other relation types that you have in uh, data side DOI metadata uh, of only six of them. And actually, as Ted mentioned, they have a double, uh, double, uh, double relationship. Um, and we put it in, in, in that, we presented it in RDA, and we have been putting it on our website, actually, talking with everybody that is working in citations. I mean, people that collaborate, we, we collaborate in ORCID, and people that we collaborate in Xcolix as well. To everybody follow that standard, or just using those uh, six types, three relation types, and the combinations that they can, the permutations they are in, in between those two things. Um, I think like I can put the link in the comments about how, what is it, what it would, what is has that subset, which is what, after many discussions, we got to that point. Awesome, that would be helpful if you can put that in. I think the issues again that I'm trying to highlight here, and I don't think we're going to come out with answers, is. There are these great reasons, as Ted's explained, as Datasite has put together for why there's these types. 
but there's also researchers who have never published their data who have come here and don't understand what the one is. And I see a lot of people noting, what about using research librarians and data curators and harnessing that knowledge? But um, as important as it is to make sure that we have a role for those experts and data librarians in this, I also, as a repository, want to be teaching researchers along the way. And so there has to be a reason uh, or a way to bring that together. Um, and shifting kind of in this, we've been focusing on DOIs, and I want to flip over to accession numbers. So um, Christine Ferguson, if you're around, she's an information specialist. Thank you, Christian. Um, Christine is an information specialist scientist at EBI um, and you're at PMC. And I'm hoping that Christine will be able to come on stage and talk a bit about accession numbers and um, how we can support linking to accession numbers um, in a way that is persistent. Um, this is something that we had a lot of trouble with and felt like we couldn't find best practices on it. So i um, hoping that Christine can come on board here and explain that. Welcome. Hiya. Can you hear me all right? Yeah. Cool. Sorry, I didn't hear your question because I kind of got shut out of the <laughs> thing while I was joining. No problem. So um, can you tell us a little bit about how at EBI uh, you all suggest linking to EBI deposited data sets that have accession numbers and not DOIs and what the most persistent way to do that would be when we're linking it as a repository and um, sending that metadata off to data site? Um, sure. So I'll do my best. So um, as Danielle has probably introduced you to me, um, I work on Europe PubMed Central with the team on outreach and um, communication. And our experience on, on Europe PMC has been that many researchers don't actually use um, the full uh, um, persistent identifiers. In fact, if they put any accession number at all, so those we're talking about those tiny little numbers at the end, the G2, B, C, that means nothing to anybody. They don't even put those in. So having that in is a plus. And then we use means to track that down because we're at the EBI and we understand accession numbers. Um, but um, if researchers could put in um, the, the source of that uh, um, data set. So, you know, even just mentioning the repository where it is put. And sometimes the URL actually contains that information. And this is the reason why URLs for researchers, we, you know, we're actually really grateful when they do put that in because at least we can Google it, if nothing else. If the URL isn't persistent or has changed, we can Google it and find it and text mine it and put it in Europe, PubMed Central. Um, in terms of um, publishers or uh, data repositories like yourselves using accessions. Um, I think identifiers.org, which has been mentioned in the chat, I see, I think Martin Fenner mentioned it. Um, so they're a resolving service and um, they make compact identifiers out of um, accessions. So that funny little number at the end, which is the G2BC or whatever, can be attached to a three a three letter code for the repository. So if it's protein data bank it would be PDB, colon, and then the funny little number at the end. And identifies.org resolves that um, to the landing page for that particular protein structure. So I think if um, it's possible to integrate identifies.org and there is a website with all that sort of information on it, that would be the best way to link into um, accessions used in the life sciences. And they're unlikely to change. So I'm not sure how you would link that. Some do use DOIs, um, but um, I think the you know, they're not going to scrap the practice of using accessions now that they've been using them for 40 years, I think. Yeah, that makes that makes total sense. We looked at identifiers.org and the compact identifier model. And a big thing that we were wondering is if we were going to do that transformation for a researcher, how we could best explain it, which is kind of the questions that have been coming up in the last hour. If we're going to, they're going to put in, you know, just protein data bank and then the accession number. And then we turn that into identifiers.org slash and the number. How do we explain that value and why we're making those changes? And so I think all, everything that's being written in the chat right now is so true about why all of this is important. And I'm hoping that we can find ways and offline how we can 
take this and then make it into ways that translate to our researchers. How can we show them why this is so important, that it's a persistent identifier, that it's preserved, that it's accessible, but in a way that they understand so that when we do, if we can automate some of this for them, um, how do we explain that? And that's a big thing that I'm wondering about. Um, and I think Martin, I was trying to catch the chat. I see that Martin Fenner had said something about how data citation is really this important thing. And so there's all these nuanced relationship types and Ted's explaining and Christian why it's important to have all of these different types. But at the end of the day, we all have the same goal, which is that we want to have a larger knowledge graph where things are related. We can see citations. We can see the usage of the data sets and everything related to it. And so we've been focusing a lot on DOIs. And I'm wondering, Christine, do you have any thoughts on how you see accession numbers playing into the data citation world going forward? Well, I think, um, you know, impressing upon researchers that having an identifier for their specific data sets that can be cited is um, probably the key way of hooking people. And at least if they use that identifier, and then we tell them what we need to know where it, that's just a local identifier. So it's not going to translate to someone on the other side of the world. So you need to know where it is. And then you need to have a resolver. I mean, those are all upstream things. And I think starting at point one for a researcher who doesn't have a lot of time and don't want to be digging around trying to understand three digit codes or um, prefixes for um for resources um it's important that we get at least just one one thing out there and that's the identifier a, a small piece of the identifier um i think dois is you know a lot of researchers are using dois for papers so perhaps it's just a small leap to say come on you know use them for your your data sets as well. And so perhaps DOIs, you know, will catch on more. Um, the life sciences is pretty stuck in its ways though. So I'm not sure how that will translate. Um, it's a long way to go to overtake the accessions that are out there. Yeah, well, it sounds like identifiers.org might be our first step into kind of getting that together. Um, thank you, Christine, for coming on stage. Um, I want to open it up uh, to questions in general. So. Um, that was really, you know, the last question that I had posed. Um, and what I'm, you know, what I'm trying to push here as an overarching theme, and I think everyone's kind of caught it, is if we want to get the best metadata, get researchers on board with what we're doing, support this all, we need to be flexible to all get to that end goal that we're talking about here. Um, so if anyone has more thoughts on that in chat, I would love to document this so that we can take things offline. But um, are there any questions in these last minutes? I will look. John, is it in the q and A? I I should look at? Yeah, so if you go down to the ask a question section, it looks like um, we've been moving some over there. Uh, you know, there were questions about identifiers.org. Um, there's also just the, the question about, um, going back to your idea of your question around relationship types, you know, this idea that um, relationship types that have been declared within the world, um, within CrossRep data site, other places as related items, they're very messy already, as you were pointing out. So I don't know if there are any um, projects or, or ideas of projects that we could do to try to help clean up the legacy corpus of bad relationships. <laughs> I also think it's funny that Ted started bringing up like metaphors to personal relation, romantic relationships. But anyways, um, I don't know if there are any um, projects that you're aware of or any ideas. I don't, does anyone else, is anyone aware of, of projects that John just mentioned that, that we should be looking at? I know that a lot of resources have been being dropped in the chat here. Yeah. Um, um, I'm not sure which questions were copied over to Slack. Was there a specific one that hasn't been copied yet that I should look at? Um, we'll copy them over after the talk is over. Um, okay. Another uh, question is, uh, you mentioned researchers uh, who are uploading content to Dryad and having uh, issues understanding how to do it. Um, but what about research libraries and data stewards? And how do we think that, you know, working with them is a, is a possible um, uh, way of bridging that gap? And, you know, especially when they're they're submitting on behalf of researchers. 
Yeah, so we do get a fair amount of um, data librarians getting involved in this and a lot of data managers who are submitting the data sets. And I think that a big question mark I have around all of this is how, well, even when we had our data curators at Dryad assigning the relationships, which relationships? How do we know if a researcher just gave us, you know, um, two data sets that are related to it. How do we know what the relationship type that is correct is? And even if that is the expertise of a metadata librarian or a data manager, data librarian, without having a conversation with the researcher to say, well, what is it? And did it derive from this? Or is it just related? Or is it part of the same data set? Um, so there's a lot of back and forth that would still need to go on. And I think a lot of it still comes down to um, you know, the community work. I know that there's been RDA work, Christian mentioned, but there's 20 plus relationship types. And what are the right ones when a lot of them sound exactly the same? Um, and so I would love to involve um, those experts that were named in the question more, but I think there's some upstream work that we still need to do to decide how important is it that there's specific relationship types? What are the right ones for situations? And having more community guidance around that. Great. Um, I'm going to go ahead and call time just because we are at five till and we got to transition over to Laura's talk. But thank you very much, uh, Daniela. We really appreciate it. And on behalf of the entire crowd, I will um, I will clap and say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thanks for uh, dealing with the virtual format. And it was great to have uh, you. Um, keep this conversation and this um, about relationship types and the way that we work with users and researchers and um, interacting with us on this topic. So thank you very much.